Hi, I'm Joe Feeks, editor of Poultry Health Today, and with me is Dr. Ashley Peterson. She's Vice President of Science and Technology for the National Chicken Council. Always great to see you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Could, could you just take a minute to walk us through what's going on with Salmonella and Campylobacter right now? Because I know USDA FSIS has put uh, the industry in three categories as far as Salmonella is concerned, and they're publishing uh, new information every month. They had started to do that for Campylobacter, then they stopped doing it. They're going to go back to it. What specifically happened there? So several years ago, um, the agency switched to a neutralized buffered peptone water because of some concerns with antimicrobial carryover. And what ended up happening in that process was the Campylobacter um, number started becoming becoming very depressed because the Campylobacter wasn't surviving in the neutralized buffered peptone water. So the agency looked at that data and thought, we need to do something a little different. So they changed their detection method from a direct plate to an enrichment method, which is a much more sensitive method, um, as well as, in the meantime, the data started shifting. So we started seeing more and more Campylobacter um, from the chicken rinse aids, whether that's parts or whole birds or comminuted. And so the agency again said, well, we need to do and propose a new performance standard because we changed our method and the industry has supported um, you know, following that path and doing a new performance standard, which is coming out tomorrow for common nuded poultry. And so August 2019, we're getting these new standards for Campylobacter for ground meat and they're yes. proposed standards. Proposed standards. And then for chicken parts and whole carcass, when can we expect to see those? Um, they're saying sometime this fall. They um, collected a year's worth of data and are analyzing that data and then again they will propose a performance standard for both whole birds and parts and then we will have a roughly 60 day comment period um, to provide some feedback to the agency and then we'll have an implementation period like we usually do and then it's game on. So maybe middle of 2020 would you guess? Probably. It's a, it's a good guess. So I, I, people tend to put Campylobacter and Salmonella under the same umbrella. They're both foodborne pathogens. They get a lot of attention, a lot of headlines, um, but they, they really act quite differently, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah, the, the methods to control Salmonella and Campylobacter are very different, both in live production and um, in the processing plant themselves. And in fact, uh, another thing the agency is doing is they've had a, they proposed a compliance guide back in 2015. They've gone back and are reviewing that compliance guide right now. And as we understand it, they're gonna be dividing that compliance guide between Salmonella and Campylobacter, not both lumped into one because the agency too has realized that they're very different bacteria and they act very differently. And apparently uh, very difficult or different to manage uh, as well because Salmonella is vertically transmitted, Campylobacter horizontally. Correct. And so does that create special challenges for uh, the poultry industry? I, I think it will. I think we as an industry have been very much focused on um, salmonella control, salmonella best practices, you know, throughout the production continuum from the feed mills to the hatchery to breeders to grow out and everywhere in between. And now we're going to have to uh, rethink how we do some things so that we can control both pathogens to minimize what we're bringing in the plant. And it's really a challenge because both pathogens just tend to be ubiquitous in poultry. They absolutely are. And with, with Campylobacter, I mean, is, is that a situation where uh, people who buy chicken need to be careful about how they handle it. I know that's the case with salmonella, but is that also uh, a concern with Campylobacter? Well, proper handling um, and proper cooking is always important when you're dealing with raw agricultural commodities because they have the potential of having a bacteria on them. So I don't know that consumers should do anything differently because <clears throat> of the potential presence of either pathogen. Um, but again, cooking your chicken to 165, you know, um, making sure you're not cross-contaminating in the kitchen, washing your hands, all those things are very important. So again, looking ahead to roughly mid-2020 when we may have these new Campylobacter standards published and presumably in categories one, two, and three, just like salmonella, what do poultry producers in the U.S. need to do right now to get ready for this? That's a great question. Um, I think the industry has always, you know, we see things coming and, and we need to prepare. I think we need um, and it's not available yet, but we need better um, live production interventions. We don't have a Campylobacter vaccine right now, for example. 
Um, and something like that would be very, very helpful um, to minimize the uh, load in the birds as they come into the plant. There's other um, antimicrobials that are out there that we can use in the processing plant themselves. I think we need to be doing some work um, you know, looking at those, maybe changing up our intervention strategies just a bit, whether that's a, a pH issue in the um, antimicrobial application or whether that's a concentration. I don't have the answer, but the industry will come up with the answer, I'm sure. Okay. So I want to stick to food safety, but let's uh, shift gears to Salmonella infantis. Okay. Um, what is it about Infantis that has really caught the industry's attention? Well, it definitely caught the agency's attention because it is a multi-drug resistant. It has a very um, interesting plasmid on it that um, CDC and FSIS and FDA have all kind of been following. Um, we had that, an outbreak actually started in January of 2018 and went through January of 2019 of Infantis. And what was really interesting about it was they found it in 76 um, processing plants the exact same um, whole genome sequence match. So 76 plants had the exact same infantis, and that's very different than a lot of other foodborne hmm. pathogens where you may have a, another ser a serotype of salmonella where you know that it came from one specific location, and then a lot of times that would result in a recall. Under this circumstance, it was found across the industry, across the country, pretty much. And so they couldn't s exactly figure out the source of the Infantis. And what was interesting about it too is that we, you know, it, it was the normal epidemiological curve where you see a peak and then number of case patients, um, you know, go down. But we don't really understand where it came from or why it went away. It was just, it just happened. But your group conducted a, a survey, I think it involved 11 broiler companies, 121 different establishments. Could you Tell us about that. Were there any common denominators on, on farms where Infantis was found? Not necessarily. Um, you know, the survey that we did, two-thirds of the um, respondents were um, raising birds without antibiotics. So mm. that was a question as to whether or not that contributed to the Infantis. Again, this was just a, a very uh, generic sort of survey, so we don't really have a, mm -hmm. a link between the using of antibiotics and Infantis itself. And there are other potential reasons. It could have been feed contamination that um, introduced Infantis to the system. Of course, poultry production is very complicated and um, we move lots of things around the system. So you know, trying to pinpoint exactly what, you know, how it was introduced and then how it went away um, is very interesting. But we do know that you know, based off the survey that Vaccine pressure is um, something we're definitely doing. All the breeders that were part of this survey were all vaccinated, um, and most of them were, bo were using both a commercial and autogenous vaccine in their breeder vaccine program. And when you're talking about vaccine pressure, you're talking about the vaccine's pressure on the bacteria or the other way around? The vaccine's pressure on the bacteria itself. So when you make an autogenous vaccine, it would be great to put 2,000 plus serotypes in a vial, sure. but that's a really big needle. And so we're not gonna, um, we wouldn't go down that path, but you only normally use two or three serotypes. And so depending on what serotypes you're picking to put in your vaccine, that may put pressure on other serotypes, good or bad, or open up the door for another serotype to take its place because Salmonella works that way. Um, and you open the door and it's gonna come in. And have you seen that over the years where, you know, we're vaccinating for one serotype and then it just evolves into, you start seeing another serotype emerge in the chickens? Well, I, I haven't followed that data that closely, but it is a possibility that, you know, the vaccine pressures that we do put on the, our breeders changes and, and creates those shifts. Because mm -hmm. we have seen, you know, over the past five, ten years, the, the number, the top five serotypes that CDC is looking at changes. Mm -hmm. So why? Yeah. And I don't have an answer. There's a, we could make a list of potentials, but what's causing that shift? And it's interesting to note, and maybe it's purely circumstantial, but you said that um, two thirds of these farms were raising birds without antibiotics. Salmonella is of course a bacterium. Campylobacter is a bacterium. Uh, we're pulling out the antibiotics because that, that is what customers want. Are we setting ourselves up for more food safety issues in the process? I think if 
If well managed, any system can work um, very well, both on a welfare and food safety front. Um, I, again, I don't know that there is a correlation between the two, but in the industry's definitely been looking at probiotics and other things to include um, in the diet that would help minimize um, the, the loading of both Salmonella and Campylobacter. And as we move forward with getting these Campylobacter standards finalized, uh, my gut tells me that National Chicken Council will have a lot to say about that. Uh, what sort of things will you be looking at uh, when these standards come out, you know, especially for parts and, and, and carcasses, and, and how are you going to try to move the needle? So, of course, we always um, will review whatever comes out. Um, we will look, we'll want to look at the data and make sure that, you know, it's a robust data set and the, how they came up with their, their numbers are their performance standards. Of course, having time is always important because we're going to have a fundamental change, I think, from focusing mostly on salmonella to now trying to address both of these pathogens, which are very, very different. So we will be asking for additional time to allow the industry to implement some of those controls. And with the current setup for salmonella, categories one, two, and three, how is that working out for the industry? Is that a fair way to divide things up? I don't know if I'd use the word fair. It is um, the, the way the agency used categories is to demonstrate process control so that you are, make sure that you are doing what you need to be doing in the plant. Um, one thing the agency did change as of this month was um, improved sample frequency. The, a number of plants were being sampled at a very different and disproportionate rate, which would could potentially put some one plant at a disadvantage over another. So they are really streamlining um, that uh, sample frequency, which I think is going to help the industry and something that we've asked the agency to consider for a number of years and are just really happy that they, okay. that they did. What is National Chicken Council telling I its members about this? How do you bring these two sides together, live production and processing, to, to do a better job with these foodborne pathogens? That's a great question. I don't know that NCC has much influence on um, that per se, but I think that you know, the more we can talk about it and talk about what's coming with the live production folks, whether that's the corporate veterinarians or, or what have you, so that they are aware um, of, what, of what's coming and that the people that are working in the plant, whether that's food safety quality assurance um, professionals, are aware of what's coming and hopefully they can work together to try to find some solutions because um, at the end of the day, it takes, it takes an army, and we're going to need an army to get Campylobacter under control. We certainly will, and it's a rapidly evolving story, so I know we'll have more conversations about yes, this. Yes, we will. <laughs> We've been talking to Ashley Peterson. She's Vice President of Science and Technology for National Chicken Council. Ashley, again, thanks for coming by. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.